Good evening everybody and welcome to the State Logistics Centre here uh, at Scoresby, the CFA facility that gets everything that you need uh, to you in the field and uh, it's fantastic to be here this evening. Uh, as always, uh, when we do these things, I'd like to acknowledge the Aboriginal lands to which we all meet virtually on tonight and pay my respects uh, to Elders past and present and also welcome any Elders of other Aboriginal communities that may be watching us uh, this evening. Well, we're leading into a special event known as International Women's Day. It's something that CFA has celebrated for quite some time uh, and really does go and show the valuable work and contribution that our women in CFA make to not only to make this a great organisation, but to also work tirelessly to keep our communities safe. I'm joined uh, today on the panel uh, by a number of distinguished and special guests. Uh, our CEO, Natalie McDonald. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we've got Madison. Welcome, Madison. Hi, Jason. And uh, in the high biz, supporting the... Uh, the, the supply the, chain and logistics that's team. That's it. That's it. SLC. Doing, doing a very, uh, very good job of that. Uh, Pauline, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, Janine, welcome. Thank you. Excellent. So we're going to hear some, uh, some really great uh, stories and, and contributions uh, from, the, from the team. Look, earlier tonight, uh, uh, Natalie and myself, and, and with our lovely... Uh, live audience here today, uh, our uh, Women's Advisory Committee. We had a bit of a meeting uh, had, and discussed some, some very vital uh, yeah, topics for, for, what, for, for women in, in CFA. Uh, but it was also somewhat a little bit special because we had some guests tonight as well. Um, and that is uh, shout, and a big shout out to, to Dawn Hartog, AFSM, uh, and Peter Shaw, AFSM, who uh, 
you know, really stayed behind after a, a board subcommittee we had yes. earlier on in the day. It's sort of been a bit of a day of meetings. Uh, it has been, it? yep. Um, to, to A, listen to what the women of CFA wanted to talk about and contribute, but also be here tonight uh, to celebrate in our PP&C summit. So um, thank you for, for joining us. And how important, Natalie, is it that you know, we have yeah, members of the authority participating in events like tonight? Oh, I think it's really important and we're, we're very lucky um, to have a number of members of our authority that we often refer to as the board who spend a lot of time out and about with our volunteers and of course we, the structure of our board is that um, a number of our board members are volunteers themselves but they really do go over and above to support us in a number of the initiatives and activities that we're working on and so it was great to have them here today and um, and they're still here um, in the audience there and have probably got a few hard questions lined up for us later on Jason. And I'd be disappointed if they if they didn't. Um, it's not a volunteer forum, uh, it's, it is a something special uh, than a volunteer forum and that is our PPE summit and we've been talking about doing this event uh, for quite some time and we'll, we'll join you again later on in the month uh, for our regular volunteer forum. Um, but as usual, we are live uh, on, on our YouTube channels and the like. Uh, we do have the ability to have people uh, ha ha chat and ask questions. So I uh, encourage everyone to tell us where you're, where you're watching from. Uh, and, uh, and if you are uh, one of our uh, important females in CFA, I'd actually be keen to hear what some of your challenges are and you know, some topics for the panel uh, and topics for, for, for everyone to sort of talk through. So uh, be brave. Uh, and let's uh, let's have a really good uh, session uh, this evening, um, Natalie. I know you uh, obviously a very big advocate, uh, and rightfully so. And, and yeah, when we created the Women's Advisory Committee, um, there were some common themes that we were sort of hearing time and time and time again, wasn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, training comes up in every CFA forum. Doesn't matter who's um, you know who's in the audience and who who we're meeting with. So. Training has been a big issue um, and one that we'll continue to have conversations about. But the other one has been about um, the challenge for our women members. And can I just say, it's not just women members. I think we have to think more broadly um, about the challenges of PPE um, and C than, you know, than um, it being limited to one gender. But there are particular challenges in, um, in some of our work in making sure that we've got the right gear um, for our women members and so it came up as a very strong theme um, over a long period of time and a very strong theme to kind of have a discussion about what is the CFA doing to try and improve um, the fit and, um, and cut and, and access to the right equipment for our women members and that's partly what tonight's about. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think the other thing to note, Jason, which we have done as part of this is understand that this is actually an international issue. Mm. Um, this is not just a CFA issue. The challenge of recognising that um, there are women firefighters or firefighters who don't fit what has traditionally in the past been the norm in terms of their physique. Um, and we've got to provide safe gear for all of them. Absolutely. And speaking of, of all things international, I know you know, Madison will be watching you a little later on and you have, yes. you've had some very interesting conversation with some of our international counterparts talking about this very important uh, important subject. But I might go um, Janine, uh, again, a, a staunch advocate and one that uh, who's contributed greatly to the Women's Advisory Committee. And Thank you. Um, sadly, this evening, you've given us some news. Oh, well, it's my last WAC meeting tonight. I've been on the WAC since the inaugural meeting back in August, two and a half years ago. Um, it's been a great experience, but it's time for some of the younger ones to step mm -hmm. up to the mark. So what's been your observations and I guess and why it's so important that we hold a, a forum and a summit like this? I think because the feedback that I've been getting from members in the districts that I represent has been about um, particular issues regarding PPE, PPC for women. Um, you know, every, anything from BA masks that don't fit to boots that are inappropriate, um, to um, gloves that are too large. So there's a whole range of issues that women have come to me about and that the Women's Advisory Committee has been discussing over the years. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess yeah, some of the things I hear yeah, now, now and then is, is that yeah, manufacturers make this unisex gear, it'll be, it'll be right, Jack. Um, what do we say to that? 
I can't swear on television. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have to say the boots are the bane of my existence. Yep. Um, I uh, had a pair of boots for 17 years. I needed to get a new pair of boots. I went along to the, uh, the district um, uh, command in, in D23 to get a pair of new boots and I was offered a pair that came up to my knees. Mm. I couldn't bend my ankles in them, I couldn't get into the truck in them and they were 1.25 kilos each. Mm. So I went back and said, could I have another pair of boots please? And they said, oh, well, we can't really give out another pair of boots. And I said, well, why not? Don't you have any others? Oh, well, there is another pair that you could try, which is a bit shorter. So they gave me that pair of boots. So I went, yes, put them on. And the seams, the interior seams just dug into my ankles. So I'm still wearing my 18 year old pair of mm. boots. And I think that's really highlighting the need why we need to be having these conversations. Mm -hmm. But um, Natalie, it's, it's, yeah, we'll talk more about you know, some of the panel's experiences about PPC and fit and form and function. Um, but there's also something that we need to do as a fire industry as well. And that's um, for too long, I suspect, we've been a market taker, not a market leader. Mm. Um, from your experience, I guess, or vision, wh where do you see fire services role? And for many people that might not know, Natalie is also uh, a director on, uh, on AFAC, so the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Council. Um, how important is it for fire services or emergency services in general to be pushing suppliers, pushing manufacturers and designers to make equipment that's fit for purpose? Oh, it's absolutely critical and we do have to um, take on that role and not just sit back and say, oh, well, they don't supply it. We have to have the conversations because, you know, we in CFA, we've got four and a half thousand women firefighters. That's not a small number. Mm. Um, if you add us with RFS, for example, or CFS, um, as, alongside our um, career fire service colleagues, you know, you're talking many, 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 many thousands of people who deserve to have the right PPE. So we do need to, you know, identify where the key um, rub points are, which, you know, a bad pun, I think, in terms of boots, um, but, and, and then start those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not only national, it's international as well. And we'll hear a little bit more about that from um, Maddie. But we, we do have to take the mantle up and say, we need to have gear that, um, that meets our needs. Yeah, look, and, and certainly, um, Janine, you've, you've, started a, you've started a trend uh, on, uh, I might be calling it bootgate by the end of, uh, <laughs> by the end of this evening, but um, certainly there's so many people that are, that are really sort of, you know, sharing mm. their experiences with, with yourself, like, you know, Laurie, you know, 100%, when you want to order your own, your boots, you need to know your male size. Mm. Um, and, you know, Gary again calls out, says, yep, boots, they can be, uh, can be a challenge. Um, yeah, so certainly there's a lot of love out there mm -hmm. for, for your story. Um, Pauline, tell me, I guess, what's, some, what's been your experiences? Um, being shorter, you can say that. Smaller feet, uh, small thin feet for the boots. Uh, when I went and was fitted for my structure boots, they said, yeah, legs, because I've got very muscly calves. Um, they won't fit in the boot. So where they had to give me an extra two sizes up. So once again, the foot flops around inside the boot. Um, when I put them on, the top of the boot crushes down. And by the 30 minutes into the structure fire, I've got numb feet. Mm. So one, it's a danger to myself and the, my fellow crew members um, to walk around in that situation. And having them bigger around your foot, you're actually, foot slipping around so um, yeah you're a lot more clumsy than you would be if you had proper fitting boots. Mm -hmm. um, Natalie from I guess from the, the AFAC perspective are these sort of conversations happening uh, on the national level? Um, probably not enough um, but I think it would be it's fair to say CFA are um, putting it on the um, putting the it on the agenda. Um, not enough, I don't think. I think that um, it is something where the industry hasn't quite caught up with the idea that we've got a much more diverse um, set of firefighters um, in our workforce, however you define that, um, and that we then do need to see what can be done. So I think there is a lot more that we need to do in this space. Um, well, I don't think I know. Um, and we do actually have to kind of work as one mm -hmm. uh, with our colleagues to try and see what can be done what to get the, done. Right, um, the right gear. 
Um, speaking of AFAC, uh, Jeanette, I understand you went to the most recent AFAC. I, think, I in, did. In Adelaide. No, uh, it was in Brisbane. In Brisbane, mm, that's right. Yes, lovely. Nice the, and warm. Uh, it was August. <laughs> when it was warm, it will be in Melbourne on the weekend, I can tell you. Um, uh, tell us about you know, what you found going through the exhibition hall. Mm. And for people that haven't been at AFAC, yeah, there's usually a very large exhibition hall. It was lots large. of surprise, mm. supplies, mm. lots of, uh, you know, good things, uh, I guess, for firefighters. Yeah, some but toys. not many boot suppliers. Yeah, right. Tell us about it. Uh, well, I went to see Oliver's, who supply the, um, the uh, taller boots that um, CFA have. And I spoke to one of the chaps there and said, you know, why don't you do a boot specifically for, for female? And he said, oh, well, you know, if there was a demand, we'd do it. And he said, how many people are you talking about? And I said, well, potentially over 4,000. And he went, oh, really? Well, we might actually be interested in developing a boot. I'm thinking, well, OK, that's a good start. Um, I went and saw the Magnum people uh, who also supply a, a boot. Um, they had, and I've brought it with me, they had this boot here, which is the Magnum Volc Vulcan Wild Hike boot. And they're doing some adjustments for females. It's lightweight, it's brilliant. I would love it. So I'm going to hand that to the chief. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that's called the plug. <laughs> to, um, to, to look at. And apart from those two boot suppliers, there really wasn't anything else that was, that was suitable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a very limited supply market. Um, so I know that it is obviously difficult for CFA to uh, access a, a whole range of boots. But I guess if some suppliers who don't currently do wildfire boots knew what the, that, what the potential market was, they might actually think that it's a good deal. Yeah. Mm. Again, real lot of you know, discussion in the chat around boots. I think we've really sort of enlivened a lot of people's <laughs> discussions here. Um, yeah, and it, you know, Bronwyn says, yeah, definitely the same issue with my boots. I have small feet, but my calves are bigger. My boots have to be bigger in the foot, uh, but still tight up, up the top, which you know, I think that's you know, yeah. one of the things that you touched on uh, there. And then uh, Liam, you know, different options of boots is an absolute must. You know, different fits, shapes, sizes and comfort. And I think that's really... Interestingly, when we did a tour of the logistics centre earlier this evening, um, we, were, we asked to see the slip-on boots and we asked why we couldn't order slip-on boots. And we were told, well, actually you can, but some districts are being told you can't. Mm. So I don't know whether that's something that various mm -hmm. districts could look at in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, great, uh, great shout out there. No, awesome. Um, you know, Laurie you know, you, uh, says here, you do an amazing job from my perspective. I've been a firefighter in France over the last 20 years. To get pants or boots which fit my size took me probably 10 years. Very exciting to see CFA's commitment. Well, there you go, all the way from France. Uh, we're starting to, to, to you know, really uh, you know, you know, highlight the issue. And that to me says this is not just an Australian yeah, issue. No. It's not just a CFA issue. Like, Absolutely. Here is something, so you know, the suppliers out there, the manufacturers out there, um, there is a market share that you are obviously not tapping into. There's money to be made. Wake up, um, speak to the people that, that need, uh, need a bit of gear and, and, and make something happen. So, um, Maddie, what's been, I guess, your experience? I am a new volunteer. I've heard a bit of things from the volunteer perspective and I've also heard things from the staff perspective. And it's all very new to me, but it, it's evident that this is an issue and this is something that's really, you know, a fire at the moment that needs to be addressed. So my involvement is growing and growing. And I was lucky enough to talk to USA researchers about what's happening over in the US. And as you were saying, it's the same all around the world and we're progressing towards better fit for both males and females and all diverse body types. Mm -hmm. So. The future is looking good, in my opinion. No, that's awesome. And, and look, I, I guess that's a beautiful segue uh, <laughs> to talk about your conversation with, uh, with our colleagues in, uh, in the States. Uh, look, for obvious reasons, uh, they couldn't be here with us uh, tonight. I, I'm sure they would have loved to have flown to Australia and be here in person to have the conversation, uh, I am sure. Um, but yeah, due to different yeah. different time zones, different sides of the globe, but even to sort of bring them in live uh, would have been a little bit of a little bit of a challenge. So we have done a little bit of a pre-record Q&A where you've, you've had the important conversation uh, with them. Um, 
Can you, do you want to explain a little bit about who they are and their, their background? Yeah, so both these lovely win women, uh, researchers from America, they had a particular focus on the fit of PPC and PPE for women. And they have a podcast with um, the SH1T doesn't fit and they broadcast it, it just doesn't fit anyone. And they talk about why in the market is it not available? What can we do to influence the market to make sure it meets everyone's needs? And a big topic that they discuss is how the difference of PPC changes for when women are doing different activities compared to men. So take a look at this interview and I think you'll all be pretty interested to see what they have to say. Really originated from Cassandra and I, Dr. Kwan and I sharing an office um, a decade ago now at North Carolina State University. I know it's hard to believe it's been that long, but it has been. And we were doing all sorts of different projects within the same research center and doing a lot of human subjects research. And we realized there were no women. There were no women in our studies, but we knew there were women in law enforcement and emergency services and the fire service especially. Uh, and so we just started asking questions and we didn't like the answers that we got, right? Limited market share. Uh, it's difficult to include them in a study for this or that reason. Uh, and so a handful of years ago, uh, I found myself sort of as an independent researcher at Florida State University. And Cassandra also found herself where she could explore some independent research. And we decided to begin exploring this and um, conducting some research at our respective universities and then uh, uh, put together a proposal for the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States, uh, which really felt like um, this was very valuable and important research and it was really lacking. Uh, not, not very much research has really tried to get to a solution, right? There's a little bit out there that has identified that yes, it's a problem, in fact, we can go back to studies in 1993 and 2001 that show that women in the U.S. Fire Service have a uh, much greater rate of fit issues with their PPE and even a higher risk of in injury, 33% uh, higher risk of injury, so significant increase compared to their male counterparts. So we know that the problem's been there for a while, and that's what really drove us to want to try to solve it, right, to try to move the needle forward inch by inch. Thanks for showing that introduction. Now we're going to go through and listen to what they have to say about the PPC available in America and how it needs to change to different body shapes and sizes. Job is one of the most dangerous jobs, right? And uh, the least we can do is provide them with proper protective clothing and equipment um, that, that protects them from those multitude of hazards that they face day in and day out on a variety of exposures and calls. And really the goal here ultimately is to fit 100% of the fire service population, right? Because you can, you know, follow a, a 90 or a 95% approach, but if you're in that 5% or 10%, right, that matters to you. So our goal should be 100%. That's what we should be shooting for, is that we're fitting the smallest stature to the largest stature, regardless of gender or sex, regardless of ethnicity, there are different body types within gender and sex. There's different body types within ethnicities. Uh, so our goal really was to begin to, like Cassandra said, um, shed some light on what the current pulse of female firefighters in the United States were facing with their PPE, really their PPC. We know their PPE is a problem, boots, gloves, helmet hood. Uh, we've realized, you know, there's our research for the next 20 years in trying to tackle all of these issues and they need to be tackled quickly, right? I mean, time is is of essence here in protecting our fire service. Um, and so we really, like Cassandra said, we're trying to lay a foundation, right? That was our goal was to lay the foundation. And now that we've done that, uh, we are continuing on with a, a new project that was just funded for the next three years uh, to begin to really analyze the data that we have from the body measurements start to uh, assess where the current sizing systems in the United States for fire service PPC are lacking. Uh, in fact, we have meetings this week regarding suggestions and improvements for wildland uh, PPC. 
So we're hoping to make change, real change in the standards. That's where it starts a lot uh, in, in the U.S. Fire Service. And uh, this data that we're continuing to collect will help us to do that. Our goal would be ultimately that we can sort through the complexities of body types, proportional fit, right? Uh, and be able to potentially identify some different body types in the fire service. You know, that would be a longitudinal type study where we're collecting male and female uh, anthropometrics or body measurements over time. Uh, so certainly there's a lot of work left to do, but we've been able to, for the first time, which is hard to believe in 2024, in the first, first and largest um, U.S. female firefighter anthropometric database. And so this new project will enable us to uh, meet two objectives. One is to validate the novel technology that we use to collect that data. And the second is to, by way of that, expand it as well. The technology that we're using is just going to output measurements. So it's not going to, you know, it's up to us to really analyze and figure out, okay, you know, if the body is changing from a, a sort of a T pose, which is a standing position to a, a, a squat, you know, where are we going to see variances? So it might be like in the hips, you know, or the thighs, like we might see um, expansion there. So being able to do those different poses, the scans will be able to then look at the, the differences um, and the areas in which we're focused on to uh, make some informed design decisions for really the pattern. So there's a little bit of this project, which Meredith didn't touch on and we can talk about more, but another objective is kind of coming up with that solution that Meredith had talked about mm -hmm. earlier. And one of um, our sort of hopes is that we're able to um, develop an improved pattern for um, wildland and structural fi female firefighters. So, mm. uh, so a lot of this sort of first phase of our research is going to be focused on, again, data collection, data, 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 data. We wanna get as much data as we can um, in order to make some very smart, um, informed um, decisions with our manufacturing partners. Wow, what's some, a great, fantastic conversation piece there and some really great insights from both Cassandra and uh, Meredith. And really, I think what they touched on, and uh, again, going to a comment Laurie has made in the chat, it's not about male, it's not about female, but it's about different shapes and sizes. Uh, and I think that's, yeah, that's really, really, really important. Um, Janine, Pauline, what, what did you sort of take out from that conversation with our uh, American counterparts? They've got the same issues on their side of the world that we've got on ours. Mm. So then your insights? Paul? Well, um, as I touched on earlier, um, the rate of injury is 33% high with ill-fitting um, structure gear or wildfire gear, anything, you know, especially the boots. Uh, we just thought we were clumsy tripping over all the time, but it's actually a fact that it's down to the boots, not the person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, welcome to the panel, uh, our, uh, Acting Assistant Chief Fire Officer, Doug Broom. Thanks, awesome. Thanks, Thanks very much, Chief. Along. Glad to be might have been worried. Uh, Madison didn't magically turn into <laughs> a commander uh, over, over the last four minutes, but uh, welcome, Doug, to, to the conversation uh, and, you know, and bringing your operational perspective. Um, you know, a long, yeah, you know, I shouldn't say long career, you're only fairly young. Um, yeah, a, 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 a breadth of experience and a career yeah. in, in fire services here in, in Victoria. A question for you, and, um, and Tilly's asked, um, yeah, when will we get female structure gear like FRV? And I know um, yeah, FRV have gone on a process of getting some next generation structural uh, equipment. Um, talk us about, I guess, why it's important for that and what you might know about the process FRV has gone through. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chief. So I wouldn't like to speak on behalf of FRV, but certainly I have experience um, both in being issued the structural gear myself and up until recently, <coughs> excuse me, being on station with both male and female firefighters and exactly the same as being on a CFA station, you know, firefighters of different shapes and um, sizes ir irrespective of their gender. So um, certainly FRV have recently, or oh, sorry, I think it was about 18 months ago from um, at a guess, issued a new generation of structural firefighting PPC but I think the important thing would be is that uh, it's both that both 
sets of um, PPC that are made uh, supplied to FRV and CFA are both made by the same supplier. Um, I obviously have worn the new um, PPC while I was still on station. It's not it's an evolution, it's not a revolution. Um, and I would say that, um, as I said, while not wanting to speak on behalf of another organisation, um, my experience with my shiftmates um, on shift is that we're actually experiencing exactly the same issues um, with regards to um, both PPC fit and functionality and boots as well. And um, yeah, it was interesting to hear that um, you know, the population of North America is obviously a lot greater than Australia and they still haven't got right over there either. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, I'm going to say the, the, the chat is alive. Um, yeah, I think there'll be smoke coming out of my, uh, out of my computer before too long here. Um, yeah, Rachel says driving with ill-fitted men's size boots is, is a hazard and she has to be very, very careful when, uh, when driving the appliance. And uh, another comment here uh, around you know, even getting in and out of the appliance can absolutely. be difficult with ill-fitting um, PPC. So I guess, again, it comes back to that size, that shape, that right fit, that comfort and uh, flexibility and durability. Um, Natalie, uh, we heard um, Cassandra and, um, and Meredith, <coughs> excuse me, touch on the need for research uh, and data and evidence. And I know you're a massive fan of data and evidence. Um, is anyone that's, a, that's, that's around you would know. Um, where do you see, I guess, yeah, CFA or perhaps even uh, putting your AFAC director hat on the industry or, or you know, the, uh, the AFAC sector, utilising research and data to develop better, safer PPC? Uh, look, I think it's critical. And, and if you look at, um, you know, the work that we've done around wildfire, around respiratory gear, the research that's going on around that, that is part of what CFA is doing. But I think at the international level, there's probably a lot more work that needs to be done. And, you know, the example that the researchers have given around the, the issue and the fact that we have to work with industry to solve this. So we're not going to solve it on our own. We're going to have to do much more work with industry on potentially joint research or joint projects to test things out. And I think that's not necessarily been a feature of the way you know, things have happened, um, but, but there's no question that we're going to have to try and influence industry to get better results um, because it's, it appears to be a universal issue. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and I, just, I just don't think that, um, that we can keep our head in the sand and go, well, somebody should do something about it. I think we have to step into it as an organisation, mm. as an industry, work with the suppliers and say, this is what we actually need to keep our people um, as safe as we Possible. can. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of people. Yes. Um, and you know, even if we just looked at the volunteer firefighting cohort uh, in you know, New South Wales and Victoria combined, yeah, you know, that's some yeah you know, 120 odd thousand volunteers. Yep. Yeah. You know, throw in Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia, Tasmania. Um, yeah, you know, that's a lot of volunteer firefighters and yep. and career firefighters yep. as well uh, here in in Australia that need proper fitting designed PPC. Mm. Um, so yeah, there really is a, I guess, a market and a drive to, to ensure that we get the right stuff for our volunteers. I think so. And I think we have to, um, you know, we have to move away from the, in the case of women in particular, that they're just a bit littler than men. The body shapes, they move different, differently. And then that's not always true anyway. Um, you know, there, there, there's a different set of design issues, there's a different set of movement issues, um, and we do have to think about that and accept the reality that our fire services are no longer homogenous. Mm. They actually have, a, uh, as, as you said, people from a vast array of um, backgrounds, body types, sizes, mm. and they're all firefighters trying to do a good job, and we need to find ways to um, expand the, the range of options available. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I, you know, Doug, I reflect on, you know, when I first started in the, you know, the fire brigade movement, um, you know, not that long ago, although it probably was by some people's standards, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, and I reflect on, you know, what PPC was like when I first, you know, rolled into, you know, that rural shed. Um, and, and I guess the, A, it was, you know, there was no such thing as female sizing when I, you know, when I first started. Um, and then to your comment about evolution, not revolution, then, then the industry moved to this wonderful thing called, you know, uh, you know unisex sizing, you know, uh, and then obviously the conversations that we're having 
having here now. What's been your experience, I guess, through your career when you first you know, started and um, in that how PPC has evolved and developed? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chief. So I started my experience with CFA uh, in 1986. I joined Katupna Rural Fire Brigade. So g'day to anybody who's watching from District 22. Um, and uh, I, as Chief said, it's not that long ago, hopefully, but yeah, it seems a little bit long ago sometimes. But I can still remember getting on the, in the ute with my dad and going down to the station to catch the truck. And um, to be able to get a pair of overalls out of, the, out of the locker of the tanker was actually a bit of a bonus. And then if you actually got a pair of, bo a pair of overalls that fitted, that was a double bonus. So you weren't swimming in them or that they weren't trying to cut you in half. And sometimes you might find a, a helmet floating around the cabin. So you'd throw that on. Of course, there was no boots. It was just whatever you happened to be wearing in and coming out from the paddock. And, that's that's a little while ago now, and then uh, we had an evolution. Sorry, an evolution over the time, and there was different um, types of PPC that came out. I remember one uh, type of PPC that uh, came out when I was a, a career firefighter in Dandenong, and we used to call them magic buttons because, like, whenever you tighten up your BA straps, the buttons would pop off, and your pants would end up around your knees. So that wasn't ideal to come out of a structure fire, like hot, dirty, sweaty, and you know, trying to waddle out with your over trousers around your knees. Um, but we've come, uh, I think, I, I, I highlight those issues just to say like where we are now, like you know, if you look at where, how far we've come, it's not to, to denigrate the, the actions of, and, and of people trying to do the best in the past, it's just to highlight where we've actually come to today. And it's not to say, as we've heard already tonight, it's not to say there's not further gains to be made, but we've certainly, um, we've certainly come a long way. Yeah, and I, I think that really is a... a um yeah, we have come a long way, you know, and lots of comments again in the in the chat around, um, you know, form fit, uh, you know, pulling the um, seat up to the to the steering wheel to be able to drive, but having so ill fitting PPC that you then can't, you know, appropriately reach um, controls and that sort of stuff. So it's we've come a long way, but there's so much more and, and further we need to go, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well. We've got a little bit of a practical session now, and I want to introduce everyone to Nikki Lund. And Nikki not only uh, is our expo, expert fireboat captain um, of the Yildon Fire Brigade, uh, but she's also uh, uh, our project <laughs> manager on the, ne on the wildfire, next generation wildfire gear. And Nikki's going to take us through um, the wildfire fit methodology, design, uh, why some of the features were built into the next generation wildfire gear and explain some of the practical purposes of, of how they were put together. Um, so uh, what was based around the trial here is a there was a field based trial that um, two members from every district, one male, one female, was selected from the district management team to trial the garments uh, and feedback was actually received from those members that went into the design of this um, this actual garment. So Chief, I'm going to hand this to you. Okay, so just you do the practical we, demonstration. Yes, practical Excellent. Demonstration. So we have a lot of pockets and pockets was one of the things that actually came from the feedback along with, let me get this jacket open along with the opportunity to not only have braces but also to have a belt. So there's five belt loops here along with the opportunity to have braces if you choose or a belt if you choose. As you can see here there's multiple pockets. So we've got pockets here, pockets down here on the jackets, we have thigh pockets, we have um, pockets on the side, we have through pockets and there's also pockets behind as well. There's I think, Nikki, um, lots of pockets. Yes. Yeah, that was a lot of the feedback that I know Absolutely. we got. And uh, radio pockets Absolutely. as well. Two uh, but radio pockets on each side. Yeah, and I can tell you uh, yes. with, with some authority, because I happened to be wearing this, no, mine the other week, uh, last week, uh, it nicely fits a 600ml bottle of, uh, of water as well. Oh, okay. Well, I can tell you that the Wildfire PPC project worked very closely with the radio replacement project. Oh. So therefore, we know that the radios fit perfectly in here. Excellent. Sorry. Well, take us, uh, continue on the journey. So here you can see, Chief, that we have a blank name badge. So this is the same position as the structural PPC name badge. It comes with a blank one for now, obviously being in store here at SLC. And then the project has ordered everybody's name, a surname, the same mm -hmm. as structural, which will be sent out to districts and then on sent to the brigades themselves. Mm -hmm. So it is a Velcro. It will come off 
and as you can see, quite tough to come off. Um, so it will stay in place, which is great. But other feedback that was received from the trial is that they would like an epaulette. So as you can see, we've got the CFA epaulette here. You also have your group officer, your deputy group officer, um, your captain, lieutenant and CFA if you're a firefighter. And talk to me about because uh, the fabric itself yes. is very different from yes, from our, our, our well the current. Our, our current gear. Um, talk to me about the fabric and why and why I guess the fabric makes it next generation. All right. So our current wildfire PPC, the Pro Ban, um, is 340 GSM. This is much lighter at 240 mm. GSM, which um, the feedback that we're already receiving is fantastic on the, the fabric itself and how light it is um, and how much more breathable it is. So that's mm -hmm. a great um, initiative that's moved forward, but it is just as protective um, fire retardant wise as our current oh, I was Pro just Band. about to, you know, I'm sure someone yes. out there is thinking, hang on, we've, we've, we've dropped some of the, the GSM. No and does that mean that safety is being compromised? Not at all. Absolutely not at all. So it's moving forward with technology um, and just a lighter material. And so this is 69% Nomex, 31% wool, and the lensing being the fire retardant is woven through the material. Mm -hmm. So for all the Australian uh, wool producers out there, they'll be very, very yes, happy that yes. we've uh, got some wool uh, in this product here. Um, radio clips? Yes, we have microphone clips up the top here, so we can have the radio in the back and you can either take it up over your shoulder through to the microphone clip here. We also have positions no, for pens. pens. That was also another feedback that came um, from the trial, the design trial. Mm -hmm. So there's everything that's been taken on board from the feedback. Um, and I can't stress enough that the feedback is, is looked at very seriously uh, and constantly. So we will take on board all feedback that's coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and so please, if there's any Thing that people um, want to, to let mm -hmm. us know, um, send it in, let us know, because it's always taken into consideration. Um, one of the things I know, you know from my experience wearing the wildfire gear uh, in the bush, obviously, and you know, I see that you've, you've, you've actioned here some reinforcement in the, yes. uh, in the elbows and the knees, uh, and the knees yes. which I think is, you know, uh, uh, I remember as a young volunteer, uh, you know, always doing my, doing my duds before you, um, before you wore through your, uh, your jacket. Uh, talk us through, you've got sort of, I'm going to, they're not flares, we're not in the 1970s, no. but talk me through, I guess, the bottom part. Um, so we have received feedback that people can put them on over boots and, and that's um, something that they've said is favourable so you don't have to take your boots off. Um, so that's one feedback that's come through. But um, they're not flares, no Chief, no not at all. Um, but they do have the Velcro at the room, they can be tightened um, so it works uh, for, for all. Mm -hmm. And obviously again, you know, we can tighten around the hands, we yes. can tighten around the boots but yes. we, we need to make sure there's adequate airflow as well don't we for metabolic heat air, build up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and there isn't, and I know there is a question in um, the, the chat about um, coveralls. Mm -hmm. uh, coveralls haven't been produced for many, many years, and that is all about the metabolic heat transfer. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is just the pants and, and mm -hmm. the coat. Um, so it's all about the airflow yeah. and... Yeah. And I noticed for the first time we've put the badge on our Absolutely. wildfire uh, yes, PPC. Our one, the same as what you have on the workwear. In colour. Yes, in colour. Uh, well done. And the heat transfer on the back with the CFA. On the on the back here, um, Tia. If you want to walk around the back, so people can see on the on the back. We've still kept the the CFA uh, the CFA logo there. Um, reflective. Tape? Yes, reflective tape, um, which uh, has is, is all over um, th a couple of spots on the jacket and um, onto the trousers as well. Um, so yeah, very visible on the fire ground. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I noticed uh, again when once wearing it um, last week, uh, I yeah I did manage to get one of the sleeves wet. Mm -hmm. V dried very, very quickly. quickly. Yes. yes, absolutely, and that's a bonus as well. Um, so. Um, yeah, no, it does. It dries very quickly. Um, we have had some feedback that um, being lighter, they're so used to the proband being a heavier material. Mm -hmm. So sometimes at night they can feel that cold a little bit more. Um, so uh, when I have fitted some members, I've, I've always sort of said to them, think about when you are out on a strike team and it might be night time and if, you know, you might want to put a jumper on underneath, make sure you have enough room within mm -hmm. um, your jacket to be able mm -hmm. to fit that jumper just mm -hmm. in case. And uh, I know yeah, some of the more you know, common feedback that we've had also in other 
other variations as you know, a nice sturdy zipper. Yes, so some of the feedback from the trial was about the zipper, so mm -hmm. the zipper was made more sturdy after that trial. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and in terms of our burnover protection, we've kept yeah, the elephant ears. Yeah, yes, yes. So no, the collar is still the same and, and does um, go all the way up and then cross over with your Velcro. So yeah. yes. Okay. Um, excellent. Well, I think, you know, Nikki, you've done a, an absolutely uh, fantastic job and you and the project team uh, and the volunteers yeah. and all the committees that were involved in, in pulling this together. Thank I'm going to ask a question. Yes. Yeah, we've been talking about size and yes. shapes yes. and that sort of stuff. Yes. Um, Male, female, different sizing. Yep. How have we? How, yep. Next generation. How have we? Absolutely. How have we dealt with that? Thank you, great question. So the trial, as I mentioned, had a male and a female in the trial design. So both of them were fitted out according to their size um, in male and female um, designs. Um, I'm play, pleased to say that the female um, design also has uh, short, regular and long length for them. So that has come out um, of some feedback that we received from a forum that we had. Um, but the design is um, in a range from six to 26 for, for the female. Um, and 67 to 132 for males mm -hmm. um, and of course we have the made to measure outside of that as mm -hmm. well so it's available for all shapes and sizes mm -hmm. and male and female and in terms of like the waist cut the yes. yeah the length yep. um, and the the the, yeah, the inner lengths and stuff yeah we've been making sure that yeah, we've got the... Absolutely. Everything yeah, there. everything's been taken into consideration. A lot of uh, research and trial, as I mentioned, um, to go into this design to make mm -hmm. sure that we got it right. And I know you've fitted out personally. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, yes. I'd suggest a couple of thousand volunteers <laughs> over yes. over the last year or two. Yes. Um, what's been the initial reaction of, uh, of everyone? Wow, how light it is. So that's the first reaction. The second reaction was um, lovely from the ladies is that the fit is actually fantastic for the ladies. Um, so with the, the trousers, they've got the elasticised at the back um, and the option to have braces or not braces um, or a belt or, or not a belt. It, so either all of the options are available. So to take all of that into consideration um, and the many pockets and pen pockets, um, they're saying the design is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, question I, I see we've got earlier on is around the belt itself. So a um, bit of smarts went into a bit of a thought thinking in terms of the workwear fit out and the what next generation wildfire yes. um, fit out is the belt that issued for the workwear, the leather belt, um, is specifically designed to fit the wildfire gear it does as well. fit through as well. Yes, it does. So um, the members have got the option if they want to use their uh, workwear belt that they can use it with mm -hmm. this as well. With the brace and obviously the braces if, well, if they would well. wear the braces if they're if they're using a belt. Um, they don't have to wear both. So don't be cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, awesome. Uh, well, look again. Thank you very much. You, you've done a fantastic job, and thanks for for taking us through. And now we'll throw to Madison, who's on our other mic. Thank you for that. We've had a question submitted from Joe in Tarwin Lower Brigade uh, prior to this recording, specifically for Nikki and Jason. They have asked what progress is CFA making on better fit smoke inhalation protection and what is the process of the wildfire respiratory protection trials? If you could provide us some more information on that. trialling uh, wildfire respiratory protection masks um, out in the field. There are 300 um, members out there at the moment together with the Plan Burned Task Force team uh, which are trialling the wildfire respiratory masks at present. Uh, there are three... Um, sorry? Yep. There are um, four different masks that are being trialled, both um, full face and half face masks. And um, we are evaluating the feedback on um, the, the members um, that are coming in. And at the end of the fire season, um, all of that feedback will be evaluated um, with a recommendation on a, a product that will be put forward um, for procurement into a open tender market in the future. Uh, fantastic. fantastic. And, and again, a, a great amount of effort uh, that's been done uh, in, a, just, uh, in, in pulling it together. Uh, ladies, just apologise uh, for that. I just, uh, I've got an operational call that's been ringing me and uh, Doug's just been allocated the job of, uh, of getting to the bottom of it. So my apologies. 
Um, look, again, congratulations, Nikki. Well done, um, both on the next gen wildfire gear, but also with the respiratory protection trial. And I know yeah, you and I are both very keen to, 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 to get that to a point where we're able to A, talk to our members more about the outcomes of the trial and what the next steps are in terms of looking after, again, our continued membership health and safety in that, that respiratory sp space. So um, uh, thank you very, very much. Um, so what do we think about the next generation wildfire gear? Well, I'm still waiting for mine. <laughs> Nikki? Oh, <laughs> I think that, that's of one of the... It's on the chat on the, on the time yeah, frames. And poor yeah. Nikki will go back now and uh, have a go at answering them. Yes, so that's one of the things that certainly the women in my district mm -hmm. have asked. Um, you know, they've been fitted a long time ago. It just seems to be a bit slow. And some brigades, half of them have got their wear and the other half haven't, so... Yeah, yeah. And I guess in terms of some of the features that, that Nikki ran through, mm -hmm. um, what's probably what's your initial thoughts uh, pockets, what's been gone pockets. in pockets are pockets. great mm. yep lightweight um, really it's the pockets i think yeah and the fit yeah the fit. The fit. Absolutely. Um, i've got mine and i think it's absolutely fantastic love all the pockets you can get your notepad in your um, pocket knives everything else that you need and it's actually the fit is just amazing because you go in and you try on the proper size yeah. you're not just allocated um, oh well you're about that size so you'll get yeah. this mm. so that's great so thank you Nikki for all your work on that mm. ah, well job, done um, Natalie you and I quite regularly get um, uh, you know suggestions um, yeah, things sent to us in some instances lobbied <laughs> um, quite hard yep. on you know, equipment pieces of, 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 of um, yeah, PPC or whatever it happens to my, my, might be um, now there is a defined government procurement process that the, the CFA has to go through yep. do you want to step us through I guess how that's done just so everyone gets a bit of an understanding why it's not so simple um, to hey well, here's something we want bank, you know, we'll go down the shop with a credit card and buy it, so to speak. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we've got obligations as custodians of taxpayers' money to get, um, you know, to get the best value that we can. But also, as I think you've heard from Nikki, the, the design process that we're now going through is far more comprehensive than it has been in previous iterations. And I like to commend Nikki and team, particularly on, on um, the wildfire PPC, that it it has taken into account a vast array of issues that people were raising. And sadly, and I'm, it's been great seeing the questions and issues come up on the chat, but we're never gonna be able to do everything everybody wants. Um, so the process of designing the specifications for new gear like this or the next generation gear is, is really to try and get the best value for money we can and squeeze the maximum out of Mm. out of the design, but we're never going to be able to do it all. That's, that's just the reality of the world um, that we live in. And as, you know, even in the chat, people are still waiting. For us to roll out new gear to 51,000 volunteers takes a long time and it takes a big supplier to be able to do that. Um, you know, the, the challenges at the moment around both workwear and um, PPC are around the fabric supply, which mm. is suffering from international delays and all of the things that we've seen in other parts of, um, of industry. But we do um, have to go through a very comprehensive process of developing specifications and that's, um, that's what the teams at CFA do with our volunteers to try and get the best design. We then have to go to market um, to try and get the best value for money, um, the best contract conditions that we can to stretch those dollars as far as we can. Mm. So, and it does take time. Some of these things can take um, a number of years to, from the time you start thinking about a redesign mm -hmm. to actually rolling out. Mm -hmm. it, it's a long-term project, particularly for an entity the size of CFA. Mm -hmm. So talk us through, we, we touched on, uh, you did touch on, I guess, you know, supply chain, that sort mm. of stuff. And not many people might realise that things like the war in Ukraine um, and a ship, you know, a particular ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal yeah. actually has had an impact on CFA and yep. how we deliver our services. Do you just want to touch on that for us? Yeah, so we've had a few um, issues in, um, in things like vehicle supply and, and fabric supply. Um, and you're right, uh, we had some gear stuck on one of the ships stuck in the Suez Canal um, when there was a, a, a blockage there. And, um, and that took many months for the backlog then to kind of come through and, um, 
and um, be sort of resolved. Um, the labour supply issues are also playing out for us at the moment. So the challenge um, of actually getting labour, when we have been able to choose Victorian companies, which is fantastic, or Australian companies, which we do try and do, and is government policy, but we then get caught on things like labour shortages. And mm. that has definitely been the case on things like workwear, mm. um, which are the, the companies that are producing the gear just can't get the workers because of shifts in immigration patterns and that oh, pesky that little thing. thing called COVID. So mm. we would dearly love to be able to roll this stuff out more quickly. And our teams are doing everything they can to get that done. But occasional things like wars in the Ukraine or ships stuck in the Suez Canal are not things we can Sadly, control. control. Yes, yes. I'd like to All be able powers to, of the CEO yeah, yeah. and, uh, and yeah. still can't make that happen. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so, Hall Engineer, what's, um, I guess, what are your thoughts to, I guess, uh, international market forces? We heard, you know, something as simple as a, you know, a ship getting stuck in a, in a canal mm. and, you know, war in Ukraine and, uh, and the rest of it having an effect, but also in terms of how important it is for us to be able to get the, the, our PPC to our members, but yeah, the members need to wear the PPC as well. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Look, I, I know that, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk, and Pauline, you've probably had it in, in your um, brigade as well, that, um, oh, well, you know, we get it. Do we have to wear it? You know, I don't want to wear it. Uh, you know, the helmet doesn't fit. This doesn't fit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's a safety issue. Exactly. And yes, we would like to have everything absolutely perfect, but we don't live in a perfect world. Exactly. Um, and for our own safety, if we're making sure we're wearing the correct um, PPE, PEPC, that's the start. Um, even down to the T-shirt underneath um, your uniform, make sure it's correct because if you've got a nylon shirt on, that's not going to be too good for you once you're yeah. out on a very hot fire ground. Mm -hmm. So uh, making sure what we get... Um, provided that we actually wear it and we wear it properly. Make sure you've always got um, your mask on properly, your helmet on properly and your glasses. Mm. It's all about safety on the fire ground at the end of the day. You were talking about um, you know, wearing something underneath and we were talking at our women's networking group the other day about um, the cottons, the cotton yes. undergear that comes with structure gear. But those of us who don't have structure gear are not um, privy, privy to yep. access it. So, um, and apparently it's only in a male fit. Yes. But, but some of the girls wear it as pyjamas. They buy, they <laughs> bought it and they wear it as their, their own pyjamas. So I don't know whether that is something that could be offered, you know, across mm. the spectrum mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a potential, even if members, you know, are prepared to buy it themselves. But a lot of Absolutely. members don't know that it's available. Mm. So, you know, I, I guess um, we've probably got many young um, yeah, female volunteers potentially watching tonight mm -hmm. um, who may have only just come into the brigade, only just starting to, to attend incidents and, and fire going in. You touched on, I guess, some handy tips and tricks. What other tips and tricks do, do you have? Are you very two experienced firefighters um, for, for, I guess, anyone that might be coming along going, oh, what do I wear? What do I do? How do I deal with this? The biggest thing that I think everyone should carry, particularly if you haven't got 2020 vision, is a spare pair of magnifying glasses because every time you've got to look at a map or your pager or anything in the yeah. truck, <laughs> we've actually, our brigade, we've actually got magnifying glasses in every glove box now. Yes. Because, um, you know, there are so many times <laughs> when you don't know where you're going and you can't see where you're going. Um, I think also keeping spare underwear, socks, mm. they're the things that get wet mm -hmm. um, and it's easy to change, you know, in the back of a truck if you have to. Mm -hmm. Doug, um, from a... I guess, yeah, from your perspective, um, yeah, going on a strike team, um, whether you're male or female, really doesn't matter. Um, what are some of the things we need to make sure we've got in the kit bags so that we've heard, you know, spare socks, jocks, that sort of stuff? What, yeah. um, what else do you, you think will recommend that people, you know, people bring along? Absolutely, she. So from personal experience, I can say that I uh, went to um, Beechworth on a strike team and uh, got up there with all the other members and eventually realised that none of us had socks and jocks, as, as Janine mentioned earlier, but also toothbrushes, like um, so personal ablutions and things like that. 
And by the end of the weekend, we'd pretty much cleaned out all the Beechworth stores of all their socks, jocks and uh, toothbrushes and toothpaste. So um, any personal items like that. Um, and, you know, just talking about the, um, the, the, the magnifying glasses, I remember I used to relieve at a station once and the, one of the officers there had an illuminated um, magnifying glass attached to a chain in the front seat of the truck. And a, a 10 or 15 years ago, I used to sort of think, oh, the doddery old fool, like he's, he's too long in the tooth, he should get out. And now I'm thinking, gee, where did you get that magnifying glass from? Like, I wouldn't mind a couple of them too, so. Thank you. Well, that's, um, thanks, for, thanks, for, thanks for sharing that experience. I think it's really important for people that, you know, that are not quite sure of where they're, you know, where they're going or what they're sort of doing to hear some of those simple uh, tips, tips and tricks. Uh, we're going to do something uh, special now, and I'm hoping that uh, technology works for me. Uh, and we're going to now go to uh, a, a special guest, and that's uh, um, Director of uh, Logistics uh, from the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, Josh Torrens, who uh, yeah, is, is really yeah, expert in uh, PPC, PPE and equipment supply for uh, for our volunteers uh, and for, sorry, for the RFS volunteers um, and to, you know, how they've thought about and gone on the journey to ensure that they've got, you know, right, safe fitting um, um, uh, equipment and the rest of it. So uh, bear with me, I do need to put the years on. I'm not proposing to uh, belt out a tune and do a bit of DJing uh, tonight. Uh, yeah, we're not having a rave at SLC tonight. <laughs> so um, for the workers that work here during the day, it's okay. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll still kick that off. And I might uh, just quickly check on it, just for the team behind the desk, there's probably about a 30 second delay. So I'm, I don't know whether that's going to affect us. But um, Josh, can you, uh, can you hear us? Maybe not. Josh, Josh can you, can you, can you do us? you have us? I certainly do. Good evening, sir. Excellent. Excellent. Welcome, Welcome, Josh, Josh to, uh, to the CFA, to the CFA and, to and to our, our volunteer uh, forum, uh, forum summit. summit. Tell us, Tell us a little bit about yourself, yourself and some of the, some of the roles, roles that, uh, that, you do that you do at the New South Wales Rural Fire Service and what you're responsible for. Thank you. Um, so I look after a bit of a diverse portfolio, but it sounds like similar to um, some individuals in your role. I look after engineering, fleet production, assets and infrastructure, as well as logistics um, and obviously uh, PFAS remediation, which is something we're working through at the moment as well. So quite a diverse component, uh, um, but engineering sort of factors in all of those things that you've talked about. I've, I've been listening in the background and I've heard the issues around boots and PPC. Um, so it's, it's quite nice to hear that we're not the only ones that are experiencing the same issues. Uh, uh, sorry, everyone, you're going to have to uh, bear with us a little bit. It's almost like we're, I know Josh is just in Sydney. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like we're doing an international call uh, at, uh, at the moment. <laughs> there's, there's, there's quite a few <laughs> second delay uh, in the broadcast here um, tonight, so I, I really do do apologise. Um, Josh, RFS has been going on a on a journey around their uh, workwear or utility type um, functionality. Tell us about that project and what you've done to... Um, involve, involve the volunteers, the volunteers but also, but also um, um, make sure that you're delivering a product that's right for them, fits their shape and is functional in the field. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so similar to CFA, you know, we want our people to feel safe and comfortable um, in the uniform and the PPC that they're wearing while they're going about doing their tasks. So we surveyed the entirety of the volunteers and we got pretty strong feedback that we needed to go and have a look at what we're doing. Uh, and a lot of strong feedback that the unisex uh, approach was not working. Uh, uh, so from that, we actually identified about a thousand people who wanted to come in and work and collaborate as part of working groups. We, we culled that down until we had enough representation across the different uh, parts of the state, uh, also including volunteers, staff, 
in office, out of office. So we get a good understanding of what our requirements are. Um, we then broke it into two groups. So we've got the, I guess, the overall uniform group, which makes sure that we have that constant uh, image and branding across the organisation. And then we had a female specific group, which has been really important because to date we haven't really had that engagement. Um, so we've been having both run in parallel and it's been really good to to get the women into a room and just understand the, all those issues that I guess we addressed a lot of them on this one, you know, the opacity of the material, the length of the shirt, the breathability of the material, the cut, the style, the drape of the garment, um, pockets was a big one, um, modesty flaps. So a lot of those things that we've been unpacking, we realised that um, we need to understand what those requirements are. So we actually went out to the market and we looked at what was on the shelf, other organisations internationally as well. We put them all on a rack. We brought everybody in and said, have a look at the shirts. Tell us not which shirt you like, but what you like about the shirt. So let's look at all the different variety of pockets. If you wanted pockets on a female shirt, for example, what would those pocket style look like and what would be functional for them? Um, so that engagement's been really good. And what we've been able to do is then really refine our requirements to build those prototypes that really make that fit for purpose product. And I, I think um, Natalie touched on it earlier that um, we just haven't seen the industry drive that innovation that we really wanted. Uh, so this organisation, um, I guess all organisations, including CFA, collectively we seem to be putting the pressure on the suppliers to innovate, which is not ideal the way the industry is going which is good to see and talk me through so uh, rfs has been a bit like cfa and gone on an evolutionary journey so i know from the wildfire perspective uh, rfs used to have the the proband treat, treated cotton uh very similar in 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 shape and size to to the current you know, proband um, product that the cfa has that uh, a couple of years ago, you went on a journey to develop your next gen wildfire gear as well. Talk me through that and how you made sure that that innovation uh, and fit for your volunteers was there. Yeah, so I guess, again, engagement's the key. Um, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm a certain style and shape myself, so I know what works for me, but I have no idea what works for everybody else. And I don't know what makes other people comfortable or uncomfortable. So that engagement has been really critical. Uh, engaging with the industry has been really important too, like you were saying about the materials, understanding what they're doing in relation to innovation. And when we say innovation, we're talking about global innovation, not just Australian innovation. Um, because we want that global platform. We want to see what the industry is doing. So the engagement component um, has been really important on those two factors. Industry, here's the problem we're trying to do. Find us a solution. Um, and here's the, I guess, the scope of work that we need from our people. Here's the things that are causing us problems, the things that are causing us issues, uh, and then help us collaborate and find a way to move forward because what we've gotten just isn't working. It's working for some people, but it's not working for everybody. Mm. So talk me through, um, so you talked about getting uh, different garment sizes in, type, shape, um, products, that sort of stuff, and and also you know, a bit of international stuff as well. How did, how did that go? How did the market react to the RFS reaching out internationally to seek uh, that product information uh, and access to? Uh, it, was, it was surprisingly well, I think, um, was a few sheepish suppliers that realised that they weren't bringing stuff to our doorstep, that we were having to go and find it and pull it in. Um, but there's there's a lot of stuff that's happening, even to the point, you know, we're just looking up instead of the fast things, are we looking at buttons, are we looking at zips, are we looking at um, concealed access, you know, what is it that people want? Um, so bringing all those options in was, was really critical. Um, if I can flip over to, to the material component, though, it's, it's a very similar story. Um, we don't want to go out and say, we want you to build PPC only using this material because we're not experts in materials. We don't understand truly the uniqueness of the supply chain that they have to deal with. Um, and we want something that's reliable, that's consistent, but that's innovating. Um, so we want people in the industry to go out and push the boundaries, bring us something still that's compliant, that's safe, that's true, that's tested so that our people are safe, but really go out and push that envelope of innovation. So if they're presenting something to us now, it might not 
good for right now, but in two to three years' time when they have the appropriate mm. testing, we want the ideas on the table. Mm. So let's talk about uh, appropriate testing, appropriate regimes, and you, you know, you've mentioned standards a number of times, and you know there are you know national and international standards around uh, safety and security of of form and functionality of PPC, in particular, um, you know, in the wildfire and structural space. Talk me through, I guess, how fire services like the RFS uh, make sure that the products that get produced for our firefighters meet international and Australian standards. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously you start at the, the, the base point, which is give us all your certification shows you're compliant. But then we don't really just take their word for it. We obviously get the material swabs, we take the material and we get it tested ourselves. We want the verification in there. We want the, the feel of it too, not just how it performs under fire. But then how it all works together is really important. So if we're talking about a utility shirt, that's one component, but how does that utility shirt integrate with the wildland jacket and make sure that that whole ensemble um, functions correctly and appropriately. Um, we probably have seen that there, there's a lot of suppliers that focus on um, the utilisation or meeting of Australian standards when we go out to market. Uh, and when um, I guess I've engaged with a lot of other international suppliers, they all say, well, it's kind of expensive to maintain that certification and accreditation to Australian standards. But if there was a market, I'd go and get it straight away. Um, so it sounds like the international market shied away from us a little bit just around our standards. Um, but again, it's that that challenging in that, well, I just need you to meet or exceed that standard. So let, let's understand what that is. Let's collaborate with AFAC working groups, which obviously we do. Let's see what everyone else is doing, because again, I do feel like Australia is a unique place in that we, we get what our limited supplies show us. You know, we go to an AFAC conference and we see what's on the stand, but it's only a small snippet of what the actual market has to offer us. So how how do we get that worldwide view, but that compliance and certification to meet is a really important question, and it's it's something we're continuing to explore, same as everybody else. And I know that um, you know both our organisations' technical teams um, really do work hard to make sure that the PPC that are produced, as you say, meets or exceeds um, standards, and that's even uh, that even includes what we call the burn test. Uh, yeah, over to to Canada where you know, the the garments themselves are, are burnt in a scientific uh, experiment to simulate whether it be entrapment in a in a bushfire environment or uh, or, or an internal firefighting uh, offensive operation for. A, for a structure, and I think that, yeah, we need to do that to give our people the confidence that the the equipment that we produce, you know, is safe and and uh, and fit for purpose. Absolutely, and you know, being a volunteer myself, like I want to know that the PPC is going to work. I, I just don't want to rely on a certification that a supplier has submitted as part of a multi million dollar tender. I truly want to know that we've exhausted every option to make sure that it does function the way it's supposed to, and that include that includes. Uh, consistent and ongoing um, QS um, through the whole process. We we want it inspected. We want sample checks done through the whole process, not just at the commencement, but through the whole supply chain. Absolutely. Well, Josh, thank you very much for for making yourself available tonight. I know it was a bit of a last minute uh, charang for yourself because uh, we were pulling uh, a few things bits and together, and unfortunately, due to some illness, we had some uh, some other segments fall out. But uh, we really do appreciating you uh, taking the time uh, to share your experience uh, in the RFS and how you've utilised. Uh, reference groups and consultation groups and uh, and science and technology to to develop your uh, PPC for for your members and I'm sure I'm sure the communities of Kellyville uh, all the safer for having you on their local truck, my friend. Uh, but uh, thank you very much and we wish you and uh, the members of the RFS all the best uh, for the best left of the season. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Excellent. Well, thank you. Well, we'll now um, you know, talk about. Uh, and throw to a, a video which really does look at how um, yeah, re US research and research and technology can influence uh, how PPC manufacturing and design can take place. Power, that's something that Cassandra and I have really realized in, in collecting the data when we were talking with women in the fire service and we were asking questions like, Ooh. Do you currently wear women's size gear? And we were shocked by how many women 
even still, I was just presenting to the International Association of Firefighters a couple of weeks ago, and I was still surprised by how many women in the room weren't aware that there technically are women-sized offerings um, in the U.S. structural firefighting turnout suit market. Um, and we can talk about some of the challenges with those too, right? Mm -hmm. But the real um, challenge that we've identified and that we are trying to pass along and share with the fire service is to understand that um, custom measuring and custom sizing does not equal custom fit. Mm -hmm. And sizing and fit are two different things. So if you start out of the gate trying to fit a female firefighter into a turnout coat or pants that have been made and designed using a male human form pattern, you're already set up for failure, right? So it's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. We can shorten the sleeve length. We can lengthen the hem for, you know, uh, maybe add a little bit of clearance in the hips. But ultimately, we started with the wrong foundation, right? With the wrong ingredients. Um, and so that's what we really tried to spread that message is to help our fire service. And certainly that's what we want to do here as well is to just bring awareness to understand that the way that the manufacturer may be approaching fitting, whether it's women versus men or various body types in general, may not be the best approach from a technical, uh, functional product development standpoint and perspective. Mm -hmm. And so that's been the key thing that we've been trying to share. So I think obviously being aware of your materials is one side of it, but being aware of the design process and what pattern, what measurements were used to create that pattern. For example, we know women tend to have um, a much greater variation in hip circumference, around 12 inches in the general population, whereas men only have about five inch variation in that hip circumference. So if you're making a pattern to fit a male form, your waist to hip ratio is gonna be much smaller than if you are designing for a woman. So the sweep and slope of that pattern would need to be different. And so right out of the gate, if we're not starting with a pattern made to slope and proportionally fit a woman, it's going to be really difficult to get that fit right, even if you are taking it in an inch here or lengthening it an inch there. It's just ultimately not the proper fit. Like Meredith said, for us, I think the biggest thing is being able to disseminate as much of our research as we can in educating um, to all the different agencies, what we have found, because I think that's going to bring sort of the, the most change um, in, in how people are wearing and their attitudes towards what they're wearing too. I don't even think a lot of the female firefighters are really aware of what their gear is supposed to be doing for them, especially the PPC. Like some of them, you know, there's other, there's different manufacturers that have sort of different um, protective, I guess, factors incorporated. And I don't know if some of them are even aware of why they're there. I think the yeah. biggest thing is like, like the gauntlet, like, you know, you should be wearing that when you're wearing mm. a jacket or structural firefighting in the US, but because of the poor fit, many women neglect to put that on. So again, there you go. It kind of, yeah. kind of comes full circle to the increased risk as well when you're on, on duty mm. because you're not wearing it properly, so. yeah. Wow, again, a fantastic conversation and some really important insights uh, from the team there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, throughout this whole process, we've, we've, as I said, we've got a live audience tonight, and that's the participants of our, our Women's Advisory Committee. Hey, give us a, a wave. Yay. Yeah, fantastic. They come up with some, some, really, good, uh, some really good ideas and, um, uh, and discussion points. But I'm going to go off script just a tiny little bit, and there are two people in the audience. I want to step up to the microphone for some hot questioning. And that's our two board members. So uh, as Larry Abner once said, come on down. <laughs> Welcome, Peter. Welcome, Dawn. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And uh, thank you for being here. I think it's, yeah, it's important that um, you know, members of the authority you know, really do um, you know, seek to not only recognise the strength of our volunteers, but, but also celebrate in their successes. And uh, having been you know, volunteers yourself, um, you know, I think that's all the important. Heard a lot of discussion tonight. Um, you've heard the issues. You've heard the 
uh, yeah, the, the discussion and the points. Um, I'm keen on, on your thoughts, Dawn. Yeah, I, I'm so excited and I really want to thank everyone um, and particularly yourselves and, and Natalie um, and everybody behind the scenes for putting this together because um, as you know from several discussions we've had, this is a really um, a deep, you know, kind of to my heart conversation and for those of you watching the chat at home you would have seen that I was cheeky enough to pop in a question as well about structure gear and research and testing on women um, which is something that I know I've been um, inquiring about and wanting to know not only you know for ourselves as firefighters but across the sector research is so important and I know chief you, you spoke about it earlier um, it just is is critical for all of our members not just women you know why we're talking here so um, know that from a, a board and uh, and a <laughs> operational members point of view um, it's just as dear to our hearts um, as everybody who has been commenting and, and watching this evening Pete. Um, Peter from from your perspective you've, you've only just recently um, yeah, stood down from the role of group officer for the Knox Group, um, and you know, how important is it for you as a, as a senior operational leader um, to ensure that members have you know, right-fitting PPC that's you know, functional, that you know, really does you know, enhance the safety on the fire ground? Look, it goes back to the, uh, the safety of our people. It's been talked about a bit tonight, and, and to the point that it's not just a quick go and put out a structure fire somewhere. It's the longer term days and days on a strike team and, and wearing that gear and, and staying comfortable uh, and keeping it uh, uh, usable for a period of time, not just the short, sharp, quick respond to a car accident or a small fire. Um, so uh, as, a, uh, uh, I guess as a male firefighter um, in CFA, you've, you've heard, yeah, you've heard it firsthand um, and as a board member, the challenges that, that some of our members have around PPC sizing and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, there's no expectation of you to solve it tonight, Peter, uh, you, with you and your, your board <laughs> colleagues. Um, but I guess, you know, you hearing it firsthand, what, what comes to your mind? Oh, look, we've still got a way to go. Um, I can go back to the days when um, we had the one size fits all, and it was literally one size fits all. And if you weren't the first one into the fire station to get the pair of overalls, um, you missed out either male, male, female, or big or small. Um, so the fact that we've even got personal issue now is a big change from what we've had in the past. Um, we're working on it. I know there's a new review coming up in relation to structural gear. And we're gonna start looking at that now and following on from the wildfire gear that we've done. There's a lot of cost involved, so we've gotta get it right, but we're, we're certainly looking at the right aim to get the right sizes to fit all people we can get. Absolutely. Well, thank you both. Uh, thanks for, for playing along and being put in the, you know, the, hot, seat. the hot seat. Um, there's no million dollars, I'm afraid, but, uh, but certainly thanks for coming and asking, uh, you know, sharing your thoughts and views uh, to this very important subject that's, that's been discussed. So thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Doug, I guess that goes to what you were saying there before about you know, Peter's story. First one in gets, uh, gets the gear and... Um, yeah, I think a lot of people would share a similar sort of experience earlier on. Yes, definitely. Yeah, look, some some fantastic questions in uh, in the chat. We'll try and get to, to a few, and I think, Maddie, you've got a few pre-canned questions as well that we'll, we might try to get to as well. I know we're we're running close to time, and it won't be long before my executive producer Brad throws something at me to hurry up. Uh, but I've got one here from um, from Dean Reedy. When will brigades and members be able to order additional workwear items such as shorts? Um, that's a fantastic question, uh, Dean. And I know I've been having conversations with uh, with Kylie Bates and the team around uh, how we will make extra uh, items of workwear available. Another one that's really a lot of people have been advocating to to me about, including brigades. Um, yeah, they accept that you know there's an initial allocation and and that sort of stuff, but they want the ability to be able to purchase yeah. the gear as well. Like a lot of a lot of. Uh, a lot of inquiry. Um, you'd be happy to hear that at state championships this year, um, there'll be something going on uh, around that uh, around that space. So uh, stay tuned. It's probably a good a good a good reason to go to Marupna to to watch the juniors and the seniors compete over the two uh, the two weekends. But I know uh, Paul Sandamara has been doing a fantastic job in making sure that we've got the ability uh, for brigades and members to be able to access. Uh, and purchase additional workwear should they want to. No compulsion, no expectation. 
Um, that's, you know, that, that we have been getting a lot of brigades asking, hey, we're happy to buy it. How, how do we get access to that? So uh, watch that space. And my big thanks to, to Kylie and Paul for, for bringing that together and making that happen. I'm sure there have been many brigades across the state that are happy to, to, to hear that. So, Maddie. So, what Chief, have we got in the can? Well, we've got a couple of questions that were submitted prior to tonight. One is from Scott from Hillcrest Fire Brigade in District 13. He has asked... Not too far from here. No, not too far from here at all. Are CFA's parameters for additional structural PPC being reduced or amended? The requirement for 50 call-outs before being eligible for a second set of structural PPC needs to be reduced as he believes it should be in line with oh and practices. Mm -hmm. Great question, um, Scott from Hillcrest. Uh, so what we are doing at the moment is uh, undertaking a wholesale review of all the Chief Officers' SOs and SOPs. In fact, um, there's a power of work that's been done by our consultative committees in, in order to, to do that. And I know a uh, big shout out at this point to Adam and the VFBV. I know we've probably been, pep well, not probably, we have been, uh, peppering them with, uh, with SOPs and the like to consult on because it is, consultation is an important part and what we do need to do per the volunteer charter. Um, but the reality is they were all, uh, some of them were you know, signed off last by, I think four or five or three or more chiefs to go. Uh, so th there was a need for them to be contemporary. Uh, PPC allocation, uh, and renewal and reallocation is one of those SOPs that we have just recently updated. And that exact topic around when, was it, when will a member get their initial set, when will a member get their second set, uh, and when will a member then get additional sets on top of that, uh, and who, who approves it uh, and the like ha certainly has been addressed. So um, we're steering away from where we can hard and fast numbers because it is about horses for courses, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing we're also steering away from a little bit is you know, the type of brigade that you're in because what we do recognise uh, is we need to be flexible in how our volunteers apply their craft across the state. So, you know, if, if um, Peter Shaw, uh, you know, who I know is a very skilled structural firefighter, uh, moves to you know, a rural part in, in, uh, in Victoria um, you know, and has the you know, competency, skills and abilities to continue to contribute, uh, can still be issued structural gear when he prov and provides assistance to the neighbouring um, structural brigade. So we're trying to think laterally about how we do those things and it is horses for courses and uh, that will be guided by, uh, by the, local, the local ACFO. That was probably a very long answer to a very short question. Sorry, <laughs> that, that's all right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next question. Uh, Murray from District 24 has asked, is it safe to transport and wash wildfire PPC at home? He's noted that FRV bag their gear on site and send it to be washed and wanted, wants to know about CFA's progress and what we're going to be mm -hmm. doing in the future. Great question. Um, yeah, decontamination uh, and contaminants is, is quite a topical uh, issue at the moment. Um, Doug, in terms of asbestos, biologicals, those other, you know, um, I'm going to call them hard contaminants. Um, talk us through you know, what that process is and, and where can someone find guidance? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chief. So um, the, the procedures for both agencies are, are broadly similar. Um, and certainly CFA's got good doctrine out there. Um, there was an operations bulletin put out in, I think, 2023, I think it was, which also refers back to the Chief Officer's Standing Order um, that cover, covers um, con, uh, use of contamination at incidents as well. Um, so if, if there's a suspected contamination event at a, at a, a fire, the, the gear's uh, isolated, people, there's decontamination procedures for personnel to follow, um, the, the gear is isolated and then transported appropriately and decontaminated. So the, the, the procedures for each agency are, are pretty much similar. No, excellent. Thank you, Doug. And I guess, uh, and I'm sure people are now screaming at the screen going, it didn't answer the question. Um, the first bit is if it's general wildfire, you know, bushfire type, type smoke, uh, it is safe to, to be transported and current practice uh, is it to, to, you know, to be laundered, highly recommend laundering it on its own, uh, not with anything else and uh, to be used synthetic uh, detergents, not natural detergents because that washes the proban out, out of your gear. Uh, that is the current guidance and I know there's a working group being pulled together at the moment to look at uh, how CFA might seek to transition to uh, and improve its decontamination processes uh, and procedures into the future. Again, looking to 
uh, where we can, where we can, you know, harmonise our practices with our colleagues from Fire Rescue Victoria as well, because we do so many joint uh, operations. So thanks, thanks for that, Poe. Um, so Madison, the tables have turned. Uh, and, you know, I get to ask the question this time. And I've got a curly, curly, curly one for you. Uh, members of the District 8 have asked, what is the official process for getting your structural ensemble? Most people would think it's a complicated process, but it's not. The first step is obviously completing the appropriate course and communicating with your captain and catchment team. Once you've completed the course, talk to your captain, get their endorsement, and then talk to the district ACFO or catchment commander to sign off, to sign off uh, the approval of your order. The main reason why we go through so many approvals and endorsement processes is to make sure each member has the demonstrated capacity and competency to do the role. But if anyone ever has any questions about to do that, we have got a really great team out of SLC. Um, they can answer any questions about the endorsement and approval process at structuralppc um, at cfa.vic.gov.au. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, because, yeah, we, people can sort of, um, some may not be able to see behind us uh, at the moment is, is you know, where, where the bulk, particularly where, you know, behind you and me, was where the bulk of the structural PPC is okay. um, and where, you know, people can get fitted out uh, and measured because it is about making sure that safety aspect yeah. and that people can um, yeah, fit them appropriately because uh, particularly when you're going into an offensive firefight, mm -hmm. uh, it is quite a... Um, a complex job. Yes, yes, that's a very beautiful way of putting it. Thank you, man. Um, yeah, and the dangers associated. So yeah. Yeah, we want to make sure that that PPC fits and, and, and it's right. That's right. Any final thoughts, Janine, for me? I think you're getting there. Um, it's a, a slow process, but as Natalie said earlier, uh, you know, it's got to be based on the research. And uh, I, for one, am very hopeful. Very good. Perfect. And I've got new structure boots with a zip in them, so <laughs> laces and zips, I'm pretty happy at the moment. Excellent. Well, there you are. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'm glad we're keeping <laughs> someone happy. Uh, awesome. Madison, any final thoughts? Nope. Well, actually, just one. Mm -hmm. We talk about needing fit for everyone and diversity, but we can't have this if people don't speak up. Mm. So. Don't suffer in silence. Always talk up, talk to your leader, talk to your commander, you know, your captain and whatnot, and make your issues known. We can't change anything unless we know it. Mm -hmm. um, or the people in the, uh, in the centre here tonight, talk to your <laughs> local women's advisory committee uh, representative who I know will be more than happy to, to yeah, that's it, hi, yeah, me, <laughs> that's me, yeah. Uh, more than happy to, to take up that, you know, that, that issue uh, and really advocate it, uh, advocate for it hard. Um, Doug, any final thoughts? Uh, I think it's, it's always worthy to note that we've still got further steps to take, but I think um, if we focus on what we're still yet to do, we risk um, acknowledging what's, what's actually been achieved. And I, I think that members around the state can be feel justifiably confident and proud to wear the new um, rural PPC that's been sitting behind us. It's, um, it's, it's state of the art and it also doesn't leave behind our, our heritage, like it's still got the link to the overalls I used to fight about as a 16 year old. So um, yeah. There's a lot to be happy about. Well, it's been a fantastic evening tonight. Lots discussed, some very, really important, critical issues uh, for CFA. Uh, and why, it's, why is it important and critical? Is because we need to, uh, you know, walk up to these issues, continue the conversation, mm -hmm. you know, make progress. Uh, if we're to be uh, an organisation that is inclusive, that is diverse, uh, and that is future ready, uh, to, to tackle whatever the CFA needs to tackle uh, into the future. And it doesn't stop with PPC. You know, we talk, we, you know, we've been talking about uh, diversity membership. We've been talking about, you know, in fact, the Women's Advisory Committee uh, earlier. And I think I understand it's, a, it's our, our next topic discussion around you know, training, uh, diversity and training delivery, uh, and ensuring that it's, you know, it's gender appropriate and the like. Um, these are all things that we need to do today because uh, you know, uh, uh, women make up 50% of the population uh, and we constantly get told, you know, we need membership, we want new members and uh, if we're not 
being dynamic, if we're not evolving uh, to harness the power of 50% of the population, uh, then, yeah, to be frank, we need our heads red. So, yeah, we do need to make that challenge. We need to break through. Uh, and I see Terry Wright in the audience tonight, uh, our, our DNI manager. I know uh, she'll be very happy to, to hear me championing the diversity cause, but the reality is it is needed uh, and we do need to, um, uh, to, to break through those, uh, those barriers. Well, it's been a fantastic evening and I'd like to thank everyone that's been involved. There's been a lot of effort uh, being put into pulling tonight's agenda uh, together so that it could come together. In particular, I want to, uh, for the people behind the scenes, uh, Madison, I know you've been doing a lot and done a lot of pre-records and, and that as well, so thank you very much. Uh, from our VST teams, uh, Martin Anderson, um, and Brad, uh, Beth, and uh, Tian behind the, the behind the desk, they do a fantastic job uh, every time we do one of these. And again, my sincere thanks to them. But more importantly, thank you to you, the members. Uh, without uh, your interest, without your participation, without the hard questions being asked and the conversation being had, uh, our organisation uh, wouldn't progress forward the way that it has. So uh, big thanks and a shout out to everyone involved. Well, thank you very much. Uh, stay safe. It is going to be a warm one this weekend. I do, in, uh, I do anticipate uh, that there will probably be a few total fire bans, so um, uh, no doubt many uh, brigades across the state uh, will be busy. And to wrap up, uh, I encourage everyone to participate and celebrate International Women's Day. It's a day where we really do get to celebrate the fantastic people uh, in our organisation, the, the women uh, of our brigades, of our groups, uh, of our, our districts, regions and state uh, that do a fantastic job in ensuring that our volunteers are able to do what they do best, which is out protecting Victorian communities. So uh, stop, reflect, uh, hold a morning tea, get together, have a chat, no matter how you celebrate, celebrate it and have a conversation about the important issues. Thank you very much, everyone, and good evening.